For those that are watching around the world, this may not, you may not know of this, uh, this restaurant, this hotel, but how many grew up in the United States and remember these two words, Howard Johnson's? That was all of us 60 and older that just remember that, <laughs> Howard Johnson's. This week, the last Howard Johnson's in America closed. In Lake, yeah, like you're really sad. Like, in Lake George, New York, 200 miles from here. And when I read the article, it invoked two feelings in me, both uh, fear, and I'll explain why, and also awe. And Cindy and I pastored for almost 30 years in Highland Park, Michigan, which is the city within the city of Detroit. Highland Park, Michigan is surrounded by Detroit. First car, first paved road, first assembly line, all right there in Highland Park, Michigan, where we lived. We lived on a street called California Street, and at the corner of our street where we bought our house, there is, we, we were 100 feet away from a Howard Johnson's that was actually on our street corner. In the late 80s, I used to go there and eat lunch, and even for those of us who remember Howard Johnson's, eat ice cream there. When I planted the church in Detroit and moved on that street, the Howard Johnson's was closed for a few years, and it was abandoned, dilapidated, um, and my house was literally 100 feet away from the, the, the back of Hojo's, is what people used to call it. That's important to know because in 1990, we started our church that many of you know, we bought a, um, a triple X movie theater in Detroit that ran the movies till the day that we bought it. And we, we, at that point, they gave us the keys, turned out the lights, and then we began to start a church. And our home and Howard Johnson's was one mile from the church. The church was brand new and as we were trying to urge people from the community to come in, in the outlying um, areas of Detroit, the police found in that Howard Johnson's, 100 feet from my house, three bodies of prostitutes that were strangled. The Howard Johnson's Hotel saw that three prostitutes in, in the Highland Park, Detroit area were strangled and left in those abandoned rooms. In the next month, they recovered 11 bodies over the area and they said a serial killer was on the loose. And as they called him, they called him the Highland Park Strangler. I knew God called me to start a church in Detroit, and I knew God called me to purchase a triple X movie theater as a testimony that if God can transform that building, he can transform anybody, um, all for his glory. And I was already, Cindy and I were already in a difficult area, and all I thought was, God, can it get more difficult than this? We just started, and now, as we're trying to open up a church, we have a serial killer on the loose, literally in our area. How, how, how can you raise up a church, God, and facing these kind of obstacles? How can people come to church without being fearful? Let me just be honest with you. How can you pastor a church when the pastor is fearful? It, it's, in my, it's in Howard Johnson's, 100 feet from my house. We didn't have children yet. How can I pastor in fear? And 30 years ago, I was faced with this question, how? How do you do it? How? And while I was trying to figure out the how, I was coming up with all these ideas, heavy security or bring in security, um, pay the police to patrol the area during services, escort people to and from their cars, um, both morning and night services, even cancel the night services. So we would begin to try to figure this out. All I knew how to do how to do it was to come up with some plan but i have to tell you this god had a better plan god always has a better plan and his plan to me and i'll explain in these next few moments that i want to encourage you with was how do you do this and i'm thinking how and god is saying this to me remember 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 that I'm going to explain to you how God began to bring me through one of the most difficult times, and I've used this weapon all throughout my life, that if you're wondering how, just remember that God can. If you're wondering how are we going to get this done, just remember that God can do it. I believe that. When I think over the 10 years before starting that church in the XXX movie theater, 
and remember all that God did and the people he saved and the miracles he performed. Let me throw up one other place that many of us know that is closed down just like Howard Johnson's because this place God needed to remind me of. How many remember a department store called Montgomery Wards? Anybody remember that department store? I went there, I would buy a king size sheet. I would hang it on the back of grocery stores, schools and the projects in Detroit. I'd go into crack hotels and I would take the sheet and I'd hang it and I would show the founding pastor of this church, David Wilkerson's cross and the switchblade on these giant reels. I would show the cross and the switchblade. And when we got to reel, at the end of reel number one, I would put up somebody to tell their testimony. I would then put on the other reel, turn on the projector and show it on a king size sheet um, in the middle of, in, 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 at sundown in Detroit. And then I would give an opportunity for people to be born again for the very first time. And I remember over those 30 years from being there that we watched pimps and prostitutes, drug addicts, drug dealers. We watched people from all over begin to become saved and God begin to change their life. And what I felt like God kept telling me was this, remember what I did before because I can do the same thing again that God kept telling me, I need you to remember, instead of trying to figure out the obstacle in front of you, just remember what I did in the past because that's the way I can bring you through this. How do you start a church in a triple X movie theater surrounded by pornography and now a serial killer added to the mix? Here it is. When the question is how, the answer is this, remember that God can. When the answer is, how are we going to do this? How am I going to get this? Job? How am I going to stay alive? It's remember that God can. And I kept hearing from the Lord, the answer to your future is remembering your past. That's why the enemy, listen to me, believers. That's why the enemy distorts our past. See, past to many people means the regrettable things that I wish I would never would have done. But what happens is that becomes so loud that the devil silences what God has done for us. And see, we end up, we forget what we ought to remember and we remember what we ought to forget. See, this is why remembrance is a weapon for us to move forward through every obstacle that's blocking our future. God's answer for a 27-year-old young man starting a church in the inner city of Detroit was not strategize, but get on your knees and remember all that I've done for you. And let me be clear that it not, not when we, when Cindy and I came to New York, when literally weeks have gone by and the whole world is shut down. And all of a sudden, when I come to New York and I'm thinking, how do you lead a church through a global crisis? And immediately, instead of strategizing, I just started to remember what God can do in the past, what God is able to do remembering what he did 30 years ago, what he remembered, what he did for us and what he's done for all of our lives, personally and corporately. See, the word how looks through ways through it to figure it out and to come up with plans. But the word remember recounts each time God brought you through difficult moments. Here's what I learned, and this is the scripture that God kept bringing to my mind today. Deuteronomy is about a new journey for three million people. The children of Israel have just left Egypt and are now getting ready to embark on a journey into the promised land. They're about to go into a place that they've never been before, fight battles they've never experienced. And Moses is about to give them a charge. How do you turn wanderers into soldiers? How do you turn people that have never experienced this into soldiers? You are fighting the elements in the desert now, now you're going to fight nations in the land. How, how, does the, how do you do this turnaround? How do you turn nomads into warriors? And really it's this, whenever you're faced with the question how, the challenge is remember. This is what God tells them. Listen to these words, Deuteronomy 7, 17. God says to them this, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? And then God, then God speaks, you shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Look at these words again. If you were to say in your heart, listen to him. He said, when he says, how 
Can I dispossess them? How can I face this massive obstacle in front of me? And literally, the answer that God gives them is, remember what I did years earlier. How can I face what's ahead? Remember what I did in your past. How can you go forward? It's by remembering what God does. God tells them to remember a 40-year miracle, a 40-year-old miracle that he was saying is a still a powerful weapon to move forward into an unknown future. He says, if I can get you to remember what I've done in your past, instead of remembering all the issues that you've caused, and maybe even the pain of your past, but if I can get you to remember the miracles of your past, maybe we can get you to start moving forward. Moses was saying this, if your question is like this verse, how can I? He says, your answer is, remember what the Lord your God has done. If you're sitting here today and you're going, how can I? How can I become a Christian? How can I begin to move forward? How can I believe for God to provide? And it's literally remember what the Lord your God has done. It's a call to remember, a warning not to forget. How can I pay bills? How can I keep an apartment? How can I get back? Listen, those that are watching from around the world, how can I get back with maybe one of the 14 million refugees? How can I get back into my country? How can my country, Ukraine, begin to have even normalcy? Some of you are sitting here on a personal level. How can I get my child back home or back to God? How can I get my husband just to love me? And in between all of these these hows, God is reminding us and telling us to remember what he has already done for us and not forget the miracles that God has done inside of our lives. I love that phrase because in Deuteronomy chapter 7, when you read that verse, he says, you shall not be afraid of them, but you shall, I love this word, well remember. What he was saying to them was basically this. He says, he says I need you to gather all of your thoughts and to keep in mind all that I've done. And in fact, in the next chapter, it's almost an entire chapter of not forgetting what God has done. That in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, let me help you to well remember what I've done for you. In fact, he starts off chapter 8 like this. He says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these four. I love that. All the way. I want you to under, remember all that he has done. And then he reminds us, he goes in verse 3, he says, He humbled you and let you be hungry, then fed you with manna. And you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he says, and if you forgot, you didn't even have to go shopping. Your clothing did not wear out, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. So if you're wondering how, just look at the clothes on your back and the shoes on your feet and say, if God can provide for 40 years here, he can get us to the next step and bring us into the next place. He says, every time you eat dinner, remember that God has provided. Every time you put on your shoes, remember that God gave you those shoes. Every time you put on your clothes, remember God made that happen. He says, you want to know how you're going to dispossess the nations? He says, I'll tell you how. Look at your clothes. Look at your shoes. Look at your food. And he says, I did all that for you. If I did that then, I can get you to where you need to be. That's why, get this church, memory either becomes a weapon against the enemy or memory is a weapon that's used by the enemy. Literally, remembering memory is a weapon against the enemy. God provided our clothes. God provided where we're going. God fed us all the way. Or memory is a weapon used by the enemy. The only difference is what you remember. Our memory is usually an enemy many times instead of being an ally. And it's amazing how the memory forgets the miracles, but remembers the hurt. How do you move forward? And this is what I want to talk to you about with massive obstacles ahead. The big thing that has hit the news this entire week that were, where this started to spark, where I saw this how rise up inside of me, was all of a sudden, it just came day after day, one that, that the biggest thing that came out in the, in the economic world was this, that the, the, the headlines of reading, economic hurricane is on the way to America. 
that the CEO of J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, says that there is coming because of the Ukraine war, because of the gas shortage. It, it, is, it is when all over the news, he said there is an economic tsunami coming, that what you're seeing with gas prices is going to affect everything, that gas prices officially yesterday doubled in America. And all when I read the report from Jamie Dimon and it, for, for Chase, when I saw what was going on as a result of what's taking place overseas, all I thought was this, how, God? How are we going to manage our family? How, God, are we going to pay the bills at the church? How will the offerings be? How will we begin to even pay our personal bills in a hurricane? How do you help to get your son through college? How do you begin to take care of food on the table? And, and as I'm asking these questions after reading this report, how do you face an unknown future? How do you face what would what, what supposedly be all the experts are telling us that are coming? Folks, let me just tell you this, because you already know the answer. When I kept telling God in prayer today, how, how, how? And all God said to me was, remember, remember, remember what I've done for you in the past. I, every time I ask how, God keeps coming back. Remember. Remember my faithfulness. Remember my goodness. I've never seen, David says, the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. It's God going, remember what I've done. Instead of trying to figure out how to go forward, just remember he's already got you to where you are because of the greatness and the faithfulness of God. Let me tell you what happens. I, I, I want to pause here for a second because I know Moving forward, as we're dealing in, here in this country, as so many things seem to be coming, this giant after giant after giant, dealing economically from the Supreme Court and everything that seems to just be moving at massive speeds. I have to pause and say this today. We have some massive giants coming our way in New York City, in Times Square Church. And do you know do you know what I began to realize as I started to think about this and asking God to help me? I was thinking of the story of David and Goliath facing massive giants just to get forward and realizing that David, in order to go forward, he remembered, God delivered me from the bear. God delivered me from the lion and looks at a giant and says, and you're no match, you uncircumcised Philistine for God. If God did that... But can I tell you what the, what the diversion was for David? It's an it's amazing story. And I felt like God warned me about this today. That here's what's incredible. David's biggest obstacle was not Goliath. But just steps before he's going to Goliath, you know who it was? It was his oldest brother. I want you to listen to this. Just before he fought the giant, his oldest brother started to pick a fight with him. And it was as if, God, as if the enemy was going, I'm not, if I can't stop you, then I'm, stop you from going forward, then I'm going to divert you with nitpicking from your brother. Listen to this. It says, this is after David goes, who, who's going to fight this giant? What, what's done for the man that fights this giant? And all of a sudden, his brother, look at this. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger burned against David and said, why have you come down and with whom have you left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, but you've come down in order to see the battle. But David said, what have I done now? Was it just a question? Then I love this part. Then he turned from him, his brother, to another and said the same thing, which would, who's going to fight this giant? And the people answered the same thing as before. Listen to what was happening. While David was trying to win the fight, his brother was picking a fight with him. And folks, I'm just telling you this. The enemy is going to do whatever he can to bring fighting this way when our giant is this way. He's going to begin to bring people that will come in and, 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 and begin to fight on, on, on minutia and go like this, and we start missing. And so instead of remembering what God has done, we're fighting ourselves fighting like this instead of moving forward to what God wants to do in us. And that's why I love that God... God begins to put that little moment that where David was facing a diversion, and instead of engaging with the diversion, he turns back around 
asks the same thing to the same people. Instead of engaging and nitpicking with a brother, he goes, let's go forward. Take out this giant and let's see what God is going to do for us at this point. That's what happens. There's always a diversion that's there and God knows he can come. There was a coming economic disaster on the heels of the Ukraine war. And that's why the, the challenge for us is to make sure that we're fighting the right battles, moving forward in the right direction. See, when my question is how, God's answer is always remember. And here's what I want to just challenge you with. What am I to remember? What am I to remember? When you're sitting here today, you're watching online, whether you're watching from Belize or Uganda or Scotland, whether you're watching from New Jersey or California or Florida, wherever you're watching, or you're sitting here in person at 51st and Broadway, Pastor Tim, what am I supposed to remember? I want to give you two things that I want you to remember that has helped me get through every obstacle, especially these last two years. Let me give you the first one. I want you to jot this down. When you don't know what to remember, here it comes. Number one, start at the beginning. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? When you don't know what to pray and you're faced with an unexpected future and giants ahead of you, I learned something in these last couple weeks, and that was to start at the beginning. But not just the beginning of me. I'm talking about the real beginning. When you don't know where to start, go way back. I ran into something really interesting that liberated me as I started to re read Old Testament prayers from some of the leaders. When they faced how, they went all the way back to the beginning. Let me explain. When they asked the question, how can we win this battle when we're outnumbered? How can we survive as a nation when we are in massive trouble? How can we rebuild when we have been decimated? All three of these are questions that how that these leaders are faced with. But they started, if I, if I may, with the granddaddy remembrance of them all. Here it comes, folks. They started, they remembered, here it comes, beginning, they remembered creation. And every one of their prayers started like this. You made the heavens and the earth. You can get us through this. If you put planets in place, hung them on nothing, put stars out there, let me tell you something, God, then this is nothing for you, for what you want to do. Can I just, can I show you what these guys remembered? Folks, listen to this. When Hezekiah was faced being outnumbered by Assyria, here's Hezekiah's prayer. Here it comes. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord God and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, you're enthroned above the cherubim. You are God and God alone. All the kingdoms of the nation of the kingdoms of the nation of the earth. And then he just says this, you have made heaven and earth. Folks, I'm telling you, when you don't know what to pray, go to the beginning. Nehemiah, when he was faced with a decimated country, and how to build a wall, leading a country out of captivity, thinking, what am I supposed to do? Listen to Nehemiah's prayer in 9.6. You alone are the Lord. You have made, what does it say? The heavens and the heavens of all the hosts, he says, and the earth and all that is on it. And Isaiah, Nehemiah goes, when I don't, even, I don't even have the strength to build a wall. I don't even have the manpower. The whole city, the whole nation has been decimated by by, by, the, by Babylon and by Persia, that when you're sitting here today wondering how are they going to rebuild my nation of Ukraine, it's been decimated by Russia. 14 million people don't even have a home. There are widows and orphans that don't even know that they're widows and orphans yet. How can I get back to my country? How can I begin to go back to a normalcy of life? Can I just tell you the one prayer to pray? You've made heaven and you've made earth. And you're able to do what I can't even do on my own. How about David? When David was beginning to face, when Israel was surrounded by armies and David didn't know what to do, David said, I'm going to lift up my eyes to the mountains from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. He will not allow my foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel, look at this, my help comes from the Lord who made what? Heaven and earth. Folks, when I remember he made heaven and earth, I can face any challenge in front of me. Folks, I was, people were asking us, those here at the 10 o'clock service have, have not experienced this before. 
People have asked me about altar calls in the midst of COVID season and say, can you still do it? Can we have altar calls? Which means for those that are maybe new to the Lord, that means we let people respond by walking to the front. Old, older believers are going like altar calls. We know what that is. But do you understand how many new Christians there are? They don't even understand what that is. And so it's amazing because for some, we have, we, with what we're doing is we've moved too slow. And with others, we've moved too fast. So last Sunday after the 10 a.m. service, I made this statement. I said, bear with us. Maybe in the next weeks or months, we will have you respond to, to messages and, and maybe to an altar call. And I kept thinking in my mind, God, how, 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 how are we going to do this? And all I could think about is this passage. You've made heaven and earth. You could do whatever you want to do. And so while I'm thinking how, 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 God goes, I've made heaven and earth. I got this. So no, no listen, I'm not trying to divide the services, but for all you 10 a.m. people in the middle in the middle of the 1 p.m. In fact, let me, let me, some of you already know what happened. He made heaven and earth. In the middle. I'm reading through Nehemiah 9 on the mercy of God, on how God, every time we fail and every time we have arrogantly acted, God showed up again over and over again. In the middle of reading Nehemiah chapter 9, some man to my right to your left stands up and goes, I need to come home. 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 And literally walks down to the altar. And then those that were here, we watched families all walk down. We watched, we watched moms with children. We watched dads with sons. We watched husbands and wives, people in wheelchairs, all coming home. And before we could even figure out how to do, how to do an altar call, God already did the altar call. Some of you are going like, but I wasn't there. Then show up at the one o'clock. <laughs> How do you do this? He made heaven and earth. He can do whatever he wants to do and when he wants to do it. Folks, I just want to be in. That's why I'm telling you, some of you are thinking, how, how are my children going to be raised in a world like it is today? He made heaven and earth. Here's a good way to start. How about starting this way? And bring those children. At, at, after the one o'clock service, we're going to dedicate. Right now, I think we're dedicating 20 children, five online, and then another 15 that are coming in. And this is a great opportunity. If you're here, just go. You can go out, ask one of the ushers, or just go on your phone, tsc.nyc events, and just sign your child up. And then be here for the one o'clock. We're going to dedicate those children to the Lord, and we're going to say, God, you made heaven and earth. You're going to protect those children. You're going to work a miracle. What do I do, Pastor Tim, when I'm faced with an uncertain future and unknown obstacles and giants in front of me? Here it is. Start at the beginning. You've made heaven and earth. But here's the second thing. Fight with precedent. Fight with precedent. Allow me to use an, a lawyer word for just a few moments here. Why is this word precedent important? This is what I want to close with. We have so many new Christians that maybe you don't, you don't have a past that you can recall the miracles of God, or maybe you haven't acknowledged them as miracles yet. And so what do good lawyers do when they need to win a case? I'll tell you what they do. They cite precedents. They cite, which means they use other testimonies, other cases, other court rulings. What, what that does is when a lawyer cites precedent, they're taking a case that's not theirs, it's not their clients, but they're giving weight to their argument. It is as if when Satan is arguing with me, I cite precedent. Even though it's not my story, God, if you did it for them, you can do it for me. God, if you did it for them, that sometimes I don't have a miracle, I, I, don't, I don't have a story that matches the giant in front of me sometimes. Then you know what I've done before? I've borrowed other people's stories. I said, God, if you did it for this person, then God, I believe you could do it for me. See, let me tell you what a testimony is, because we don't talk about testimony. I, I grew up in a time where Sunday night church, which doesn't exist anymore, it was called testimony night. Let me tell you what testimony is, because a testimony 
let me just help you, is different than a biography. A biography ends with the person and what they did. But a testimony ends with God and what God did. That's the difference. I grew up in a church that the old church mothers used to say this, no test, no testimony. That the only way you could hear a testimony is because God put them through a test. And on the other end, God was giving them a story to tell of what God, let me tell you what the plot line of a testimony is. It goes like this. It was bad. It was really bad. It was impossible. I was at the end of my rope and then Jesus stepped in and got me out and lifted me up out of the miry clay and all glory to God. That's the way it is. Let me tell you something. Every testimony was the same, but it was like listening to brand new stories because it was what God was doing. And I listen to some of those stories, and sometimes I recount those stories. One of the greatest bits of advice that David Wilkerson gave to me when we started that church in the Triple X movie theater, I sat in his apartment in New York City, and he gave me the oddest advice. He says, pray for gray heads to be in your church. And then he used another word, pray for cotton heads. And I go, Brother Dave, what do you mean? He goes, pray for old people. He says, you're a young man. You need to hear old people's stories and what God has done in their life. So right now, I don't pray for gray heads because I am a gray head. <laughs> Which means if I don't have a personal story, I find a precedent. That if you're sitting here today and you've been saved, maybe newly saved, and you're going, I don't know what a healing testimony is. I'm telling you all over this place, there are stories of God's healing power upon people's lives. Someone's provision testimony on how God provided for them. Remember, it's different than a biography. It's not what they did and what they figured out and how they figured out their how. It's how God showed up and brought them through. You need someone's prodigal testimony. If you're a mom that's at the end of your rope, you may need someone's marriage testimony. If you don't know what to do, I need gray heads in my life saying this, let me tell you what God did for me and God can do the same thing for you today. Hey, can I help you with this? If you are under 30 years old or you've been saved less than two years, here's a challenge for you. Find a gray head and listen to their story. Find a gray head. Let me just tell you something. You can't Google what you can get from a cotton head. So you better find a cotton head in this place and go tell me about miracles because it's not on you. Many times their story is not on YouTube. Their stories is not, is not on Instagram, but you got to talk to them. I know that's really odd for people, but you're going to have to open up your mouths, pull the air buds. I don't know why I'm saying all this, but you're going to have to have a con and say, tell me your story of healing. Tell me your story of provision. Tell me your story of protection. Tell me what God is able to do. See, that's what the children of Israel, they just saw the Jordan River divide in Joshua chapter 4. They divided it in half like the Red Sea. It was a brand new generation. And immediately in Joshua chapter 4, Joshua goes, here's what I need for you to do. I need you to pack up this story because they're going to need to use that later on. Listen to it. He says in Joshua 4, 22, then you shall inform your children saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground for the Lord, your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed just as the Lord, your God had done to the Red Sea when he dried up before until we had crossed verse 24, that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty so that you may fear the Lord, your God forever. He was saying your children are going to need that story one day. They're going to need that story to say, he opened up the Red Sea, he opened up the Jordan, and he can open up doors that I couldn't even open up on my own. Hey, let me cite for you, let me give you precedent for those that are sitting here that may need to know about God's protection. Maybe you're watching online from, from Kenya or watching online from Barbados or watching online from Italy, and you're going, I need the protection of God. I need. So let me cite precedent for you for just a moment. David Wilkerson told that story when he was telling me about grayheads. I remember him telling the story about a grayhead 
right here in Times Square Church of a 70 plus year old woman that lived in the Bronx. Lived by herself, but lived in a very, very, at that time, it was a dangerous area. And, she, and Brother Dave said the woman told her that someone broke into her house. We're citing precedence now. Someone broke into her house one night and she had a two story flat and she came down she came to the edge of the stairs and saw the man breaking through the front window of her home, breaking through. This 70-year-old woman didn't know what to do. She, she had no ability to defend herself. And so immediately she started yelling at the man climbing through her front window, a scripture verse, Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. She stood at the top of the stairs, Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 which the, the verse says, repent and be baptized in Jesus for the gift forgiveness of your sins. That's, that was her only weapon. The man's breaking through Acts 2.38. Act. The man, Brother Dave, the man got down on his knees, <laughs> laid on the ground with his hands spread, and she called the police. The police came in and started laughing at the, at the man who broke in. Started going, they go, she's 75 years old. She's screaming at you, whatever. And you're laying there waiting for us to handcuff you? And this is what the man said. He said, what would you do if a woman had an ax in 238? He made heaven and earth. He made heaven and earth, and he can use a scripture to protect his people. And if you're here as a single mom wondering, can God protect me? Here it is, Acts 2.38. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do you, how do you start a church when a serial killer is on the loose. The Highland Park serial killer was caught in 1992. His name was Ben Atkins. He killed 11 young girls, strangled and tortured them. He was the son of a prostitute. And as a young boy, he was forced to go out on tricks with his mom as she would work the streets. And something snapped in Ben, and he was started killing women that reminded him of his mom. And finally, in 1994, Ben was sentenced to multiple life sentences and would never be paroled. So God, when I was trying to think how security, how canceled night services, how, I'm afraid, God. I'm afraid for our church. I'm afraid for our ladies, because nobody knew what the... What, 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 what the uh, MO and what the, what the whole reason for all this was. And God, all God simply asked us to do was this. He says, I'm asking you just to be obedient, according to Matthew 25, and touch those in prisons. So who would have thought that a 70-year-old deacon couple named Dale and Rhonda, every Friday night, would walk along the Detroit city prison and they had to, anybody was on the block, they gave them permission to walk through and say, anybody want to read the Bible with the preacher? Anybody want to read the Bible with the preacher? Anybody want to read the Bible with the preacher? That's all they would say. And they, they had the permission to do that. And there would be inmates that would reach out their hand, hold the thumbs up, and they would stop, and they'd read the Bible and pray with the prisoner. And who would have thought that one of those Friday nights, Ben's hand went out. This man who strangled 11 people and Dale and Rhonda on that block had the opportunity to not only pray with Ben, but lead Ben to be born again. And Ben stood with a smile on his face, being sentenced to 11, 11 life sentences, would never see the light of day, never see free, freedom ever again, stood there with a Bible that we gave to him just less than a year ago. Let a year from, from, from his sentencing. And then all of a sudden, ben, Parrott, ben died in prison of AIDS just a few years later. 
He stood with that sentencing with his Bible. And after Ben died in Jackson, Michigan, I'm just telling you, I'm looking forward to a day that God took a man whose life was in oblivion. And I remember if God can save Ben, he could save anybody. If God, if God made heaven and earth, he can make anybody brand new. If God can divide a Jordan and a Red Sea, he can open up any door that he wants to open up. How? How? Because some of you are here asking the largest question, the biggest question. And, the, and when you think about this, when I came to New York City and realized that on May 4th, we don't have church services and we won't have them. Who knew that we wouldn't have them for 18 months? And realized our nation was in trouble. Our planet is on shutdown. How can you pastor? It's literally remember what God has done. It's remember what God has done in your life, what God has done in others' life, in our life, and realizing that God, if he made heaven and earth, and if God has brought testimonies with people all around you, that in order to face the future, you need to remember what God has done in the past, and that God can still do it again. And today he can do it again. I, I would just tell you, if you want to even hear, you want to cite precedent, listen to the Wednesday night worldwide prayer meeting. Listen to Pastor Carter's message on the day I preached to nobody. When God asked him to preach on a rainy day that nobody showed up in a field, their whole worship team was out there. And Pastor Carter wanted to shut the whole thing down. And he said, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, preach. And, and Pastor Carter's going, there's nobody here. So we told the whole worship team, play, and nobody's there. And he said, and the Holy Spirit said, preach. And there was nobody in front of him. And he said, he heard the Holy Spirit say to him, and don't be short, make it a long message. <laughs> like I would have just gone up and just go, we love you. God bless you. He said, I preached for 20, 25 minutes a gospel message to nobody. And then he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit says, now give an altar call. <laughs> There's nobody. How does that happen? He made heaven and earth. How does that happen? He said when he asked for those who wanted to be saved, there was no expectations at all. He said... All of a sudden, these hedges, some guy rolls out who's been there all night from being drunk, who heard the message in the bushes, rolls out to get saved. Another man was hiding behind a telephone pole. We don't know what those are. We have satellites now. But he has a telephone pole and comes out and goes, is this true? Nobody ever saw these people. He said, our voice was carrying out because of the rainstorm Nobody was in the area, but there was a big hill, and all of a sudden, these two teenagers come up over the top of the hill going, we want to be born again. He said, the day I preached to nobody, four people got born again on that day. How does that happen? How? Remember. How can I? Remember. Every time you say how, and let a trigger switch come, remember what God has done. Remember, he made heaven and earth. Remember that even if I don't have a story, I know, God, you have stories and some of those older folks in the church, being one of them myself, just ask us. There are stories for you young converts. I'm telling you, if you, those are just being newly born again, maybe for months, or young people that are 30 and under, just ask someone. We'll tell you how God provided. We'll tell you how God protected. We'll tell you that he has angels that can guard you. We'll tell you that he can stand, he can do things that you can't do on your own. We'll tell you the stories of prodigals that come home. We'll tell you the stories of Highland Park stranglers, that it didn't look like anything can happen. And on a Friday night, God saves a strangle, a serial killer. God can work miracles. And you know the biggest how that people ask? The biggest how that people ask sometimes is this. How can God love me? How can God accept me? It's because you're dealing with the past. The past that you do remember that you should forget. And God's going, I can, I can forgive your past change your present and prepare you for the future. That's the miracle. Some of you are looking at me going like, not me, not me. Those watching online, not me, not me. And here's my word to you. 
he made heaven and earth. He opens up oceans and rivers. He begins to use 75-year-old women yelling Acts 2.38. He can change you today. He can work a mirror. How, Pastor Tim? How? Remember the answer? Remember. Remember what? Here it comes. Romans 5, 6 says, if you want to know, remember this. When we were utterly helpless, with no way of escape, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners who had no use to him. And then it says this. Now we can rejoice in a wonderful relationship, all because of what Jesus has done. Not you, what Jesus has done in dying for our sins, making us friends of God. What do he say? Here's the answer to your how. How? Remember the cross. He loves you. That is why Jesus died for you. At your worst, when you're thinking how, God goes, remember what I did for you. How can you love me? Because I came and died for you. How? Today, today, he wants to change you. No matter what your how is, if you're sitting here today, I'm telling you, there is a moment that God wants to come in and change you from the inside out. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? It's when Christ comes in and changes us. That Jesus refers to it as being born again. He said it's like a brand new start for, for you that's sitting here today for you that are watching and for you that are here in person. It's a brand new start for you. Well, how does that relationship happen? How does does it born again start? Now, keep in mind, born again is not our word. It's Jesus' word. And Jesus just simply said this. He said, no man can see the kingdom of heaven. That's the future. Unless they're born again. Right now, God can do that for you right now. He can change you. He can come in and change you from the inside out. Pastor Tim, how can he since of my past? Remember, he died on the cross to make it happen right now. You are here today as a living miracle. You're watching. Maybe you're listening to this on another day that someone sent you the link. He is doing this to say, remember the cross. If you want to know if Jesus loves me, just look at the cross. He loves you so much that he died for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How do, I, how do I have that relationship with God? I'm not inviting you to be a member of a church or a religion. I'm inviting you to walk with God every day, to have Christ come in and change you from the inside out. That's the born-again relationship. Just Jesus uses that word. He was saying this. Just as you've been born a first time physically, God wants you to be born a second time spiritually. First time in a hospital, second time it happens on the inside. How does that happen? Simple as A, B, C. A, it's admitting I'm a sinner. Every one of us have a sin condition that we can't fix ourselves. Can't fix it with a promise. There's not a priest, a pastor. There's not a religious place. There's not a synagogue or a mosque. There's not a program that can fix the sin condition. Only God can. How does he fix it, Pastor Tim? That's the B word, believing that God sent his son to to fix our sinful condition that we couldn't fix on our own. It was Jesus that reminds us that when he died that, that death on the cross, what he was telling us was this. It would be foolish for Jesus to say, just get good, just get better, and then you go to heaven. Then why would God have to send his son to die for us if we can get ourselves to heaven? It doesn't even make any sense. Believe, believe that God sent his son to become my sin bearer. Sin had to be paid for. Sin had to be dealt with. Jesus would do it for me. He died the death I was supposed to die, lived the life I couldn't live, and gave me a reward, heaven and forgiveness that I don't deserve. And see, confessing him as Lord. Boy, that's a big word. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that word Lord actually means you're in charge now. You don't just get Sundays for 90 minutes. You get every day. Religion asks you to sit in the seat on a Sunday, but a relationship with God wants to walk with you every single day. That can happen right now. So whether you're watching online or here, would you just close your eyes and bow your head for just a moment, for just a moment. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I didn't didn't know if God could love me based upon what I've done. 
based upon where I've been, based upon what I've, what I've said, based upon my life. And I'm here to tell you, to answer the question, does God love me? Remember the cross. Does God care about me? Remember the cross. How can I be saved? Remember the cross. The giant of your past, the giant of sin is overcome by remembering the greatness of the cross. If you're here today, say, Pastor Tim, if that's true, maybe I'm like that guy rolling out of the bushes. Maybe I'm that girl that came out from behind that telephone pole. Maybe I'm that student that's coming up the side of a mountain. And maybe you're sitting here today. Maybe you're watching online from that nation, that country, and you're going, I want to start a journey with God. I want to be born again. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, would you put me in that? I want to start a journey with God today. I want, I want God to come into my life. I want the most important question. Have you been born again? And your response is, I want to be born again today. So, Pastor Tim, when you pray that prayer with every head bowed and every eye closed, watching online, listen carefully. I want to be born again. When you pray that prayer, would you put me in that? Or just right now, because I want to do something else. But if right now, if that's you and saying, I want, I want, to, I want to be part of that prayer, I want, I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I am going to ask you to do this. If you're here today and say, I want to be part of that prayer without any hesitation. If you say, put me in that prayer today, Pastor Tim, would you just hold up your hand right now? Just hold it up high. Because I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Keep them up high. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Got you over there. There's nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Keep them up. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Anyone in the balcony? I want to make sure I see every hand that's up in the balcony. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Got you over there in the corner. 25 and got you in the back. 26. You could put your hands down. God bless every single one of you today. And if you're watching online, just text the word, decide. just in the chat line, put the word decided that you made that decision today. Come on, can we all pray this together? Let's pray this together. Come on, everybody out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, put your hands.